my name is Erin, and today I'm going to be talking about animal testing. And before you decide to check out of the speech, no, I promise this isn't going to turn into some sort of PETA tirade about how if you use animal tested products, you are bad and you should feel bad. No, this isn't what that's going to be about. Um, so I decided to take a little bit more of a practical approach when it came to animal testing as far as how animal testing is in regards to humans more than animals. And I'm going to start by introducing a little bit of history behind it. So it actually started way back in BC, um, and they used something known as vivisection. Vivisection is the act of cutting open a live animal, and the reason they did this was because they wanted to save the human curiosity as far as how animal anatomy compares to human anatomy. And the reason they used live animals was because animals were then seen as inferior and it wasn't seen as cruelty back then. And now moving forward from that, centuries later, um, it really started its real beginnings as far as starting more in physiological research and not just anatomical research. And it actually became the driving force behind biomedical research where it came up with such treatments for things like syphilis and diabetes. And while it was seen as cruel now, um, there really was, it was really done with the best intentions behind it. And without it, it I mean, it even created things like vaccines for, for animals, for such things like heartworm medicine or vaccines for rabies, and also really helped to helped make advancements towards such things like malaria, yellow fever, hepatitis, and organ transplants. And it really made a difference back then. But this isn't back then anymore. This is 2015. And there is an enormous disparity in the physiological differences between animals and humans that needs to be addressed. Now picture for a moment a mouse. A mouse is small. A mouse is like that big. And when you try testing on a mouse and then you're comparing notes to a human, there's going to be an enormous difference because a mouse may share about 95% of its genetic material with humans, but mice are also incredibly tiny, so if you think about how fast their metabolisms are, how tiny their livers are, how quickly they digest or absorb the type of drugs that's injected into them. Now I'm going to show some examples actually of how different how the difference really affects people. So one of these drugs is called Accutane and the cause for recall here is used for acne. Um, it increased risk of birth defects, miscarriages, and premature births when used by pregnant women, inflammatory bowel disease, and suicidal tendencies. And the next one here is DES. Um, it was used for synthetic estrogen to prevent miscarriage, premature labor, and other pregnancy complications. And the cause for its recall was it caused cancer of the cervix and vagina, birth defects, and other developmental abnormalities in children born to women who took the drug while pregnant, increased risk of breast cancer, higher risk of death from breast cancer, risk of cancer in children of mothers taking the drug, including raised risk of breast cancer after age 40, increased risk of fertility and pregnancy complications, early menopause, testicular abnormalities, and potential risks for third-generation children. And studies in the 1950s showed the drug was indeed been effective at preventing miscarriages, premature labor, or other pregnancy complications anyway. Now the next drug we have here is Meridia. It was used as an appetite suppressant, and the cause for its recall was it an increased cardiovascular and stroke risk, and it was actually known to be the next Vioxx. And Vioxx uh, is a pain reliever. It was on the market for 5.3 years, and the cause for its recall was an increased risk of heart attack and stroke linked to about 27,785 heart attacks or sudden cardiac deaths between May 20 of 1999 and 2003. Pretty terrible. Now, so I've gone over a few drugs that have exhibited the differences on how it would affect humans versus animals. Those drugs were obviously clean for animals, not so much for humans. Conversely, there are some drugs that were introduced before they needed to be animal tested. One of those drugs is a very common one that I'm sure everybody will recognize, aspirin. 
Aspirin is commonly used as a pain reliever and a blood thinner, but is actually fatal to cats and causes birth defects in monkeys, rats, and dogs. The next one is penicillin. Penicillin is also incredibly harmful to guinea pigs, but as everyone knows, it's been used for decades combating bacterial infections and used as an antibiotic. Now, one of the alter another alternative here that we can use as far as animal testing is in vitro, and that basically means in test tubes. So what that is, is you're putting human tissue samples of human cells into test tubes and you're testing the chemical reaction with the specific drugs and how they mix together and exactly what the effects it would cause. Um, in vitro is also significantly more cost effective versus animal testing. Animal testing is very expensive. So for animal testing, you have to buy the animals, you have to buy the equipment, you have to buy the space, and you have to buy the laboratories. It's also an incredibly huge cash cow, raking in millions upon millions of dollars to for-profit organizations. And the animals that they use are not always the best models that they could. They're not used for accuracy issues as far as humans versus animals. They're used because they're cheap and because they're easily disposed of. Nobody really raises a fuss over them. The type of animals they use generally include mice, rats, and birds. It's also incredibly time consuming. So as an example, sunscreen. To test the effectiveness of sunscreen took five years and over four million dollars. In vitro would have taken less than half that time and way less than half the cost. Unfortunately, however, our technology is not quite advanced enough to completely replace animal testing. Now, part of the reason for this is because most of the funding that could have been used to fund research for alternative methods is already being used for animal testing. Like I said, animal testing is an incredibly huge cash cow. And acceptance is also an incredibly big issue. No one really wants to let go of what they already know. So those are a few of the reasons. So the conclusion that I've come to in all this is that unfortunately the replacement of animal testing will take a very long time, but we can start to phase it out. And animal testing will not only save time and money or the lives of millions of animals, but also the lives of human the lives of humans too. So this became not just a moral issue, but also a very practical one. So hopefully sometime in our lifetimes, animal testing can finally be put to rest. Thank you. Thank you. How long was that?